community and to listeners around the world. My name is Francine Lacroix. I would like to welcome you all to our cross-sector mobilization in time of crisis public health perspective, which is hosted by the Dungote Group. Now, before we get started, I want to encourage all of you, all of you New Economy Forum delegates joining us live to, of course, submit many questions for our panel uh, via the live Q&A feature. So I think you can see it on the screen, but let me just tell you exactly where to find it and how to use it. On the left side of your screen, you will see navigation bar. If you look at the third icon down, the one that looks like three silhouettes, it's the room info button. Click this and then a panel on the right side of your screen will open. Then you can select the info tab and scroll down to the bottom where you will see live Q&A. Please use this to submit any questions. I'm expecting a lot of great questions and you can do that throughout the session. And I will, of course, do my best to get to them all or as many as possible during our panel discussion. Now, I am absolutely delighted to be joined this distinguished panel by Nubar Afian, founder and chief executive of flagship pioneering and co-founder and chairman of Moderna, Dr. Paul Farmer, co-founder and chief strategist at Partners in Health, chair of the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at Harvard Medical School, and author of the forthcoming book, I think it's published tomorrow, Fever, Feuds, and Diamonds, Ebola and the Ravages of History, and an absolute pleasure also to welcome Aliko Dangote, president and chief executive of Dangote Industries Limited and founding partner of the Bloomberg New Economy Forum. So thank you all for joining us today. Now, we wanted to, to talk about you know, some of the challenges going forward, but I think we first need to give a round of applause to uh, Dr. Afayan because we had just hours ago news about this Moderna vaccine that really produced some pretty good results. H how quickly can you move on from this? Well, thanks, Fancy. Thanks for having me. Um, look, we, we have been uh, working for months to get ready for this moment so that once we have the first interim analysis and the data that we've received, we could, we could then move on to accomplish the regulatory filings and then have the, the vaccine once approved ready for distribution. So everything's in place. Uh, we hope over the next few weeks, the last steps towards emergency use authorization are taken. And thereafter, uh, we will be uh, certainly moving ahead to get supplies out initially to frontline workers and more vulnerable populations, and then eventually in 2021, certainly to a very broad population. Uh, Dr. Effin, I want to get to Aliko Nogoda in a second, but how, you know, how quickly can you get how many vaccines to which parts of the world? Logistically, how difficult is it to produce it and distribute it? We have been working over the past few months to secure uh, contracts with a number of countries uh, and are actively continuing to do that today. Uh, uh, this will be something that's distributed mostly through governments, given the nature of of the health threat and the pandemic. Um, we have we are actively working with COVAX to make sure that supplies of our vaccine are made available in, in middle to lower income countries as well. And that's ongoing, as it is with many other uh, potential vaccine suppliers. So, so we're active there. Uh, in the US, the, the government through Operation Warp Speed uh, has taken on the logistics of distribution. So in each case, it's a bit different. As you know, there are many vaccines that are being developed, and, and, and what the governments have done is to secure adequate supply from multiple different sources, not knowing what the effectiveness will be and how quickly production can ramp up. I can tell you in our case, we've said that we expect to have 20 million doses uh, by the end of this year and 500 million to a billion doses by the end of next year. And, and so between now and then, certainly in 2021, there will be a ramp up and we will go as fast as is safely possible. Aliko Dangote, give us a sense. I mean, you've done so much for the crisis and you've done so much in trying to fight COVID-19 and many other illnesses and health crises. How has this crisis been different? Can you talk to us about the coalition against COVID-19? Well, Francine, thank you very much. It's great uh, seeing you again. I think, uh, well, you know, for us here in uh, Nigeria, or mostly in Africa, the uh, uh, COVID-19 is really, it is an eye-opener because when you look at it, uh, we have two impacts. One is the human impacts, the other one is the economic one. I think in Africa, most of it is actually the economic impact because uh, what we have done at the beginning uh, we shut down all our activities. We shut down the airports. 
I know that in Nigeria, we shut down the airport on the 23rd of September, and we did not reopen the airport. I know we shut down on the 23rd of March, and we did not really open up until 20th of uh, September, so which means six months, the airport was closed. But the most effective one was actually the interstate traveling from state to state, not only here, even in other African countries, where you are not allowed to move all over the place, and the uh, you know farmers were not able to sell their produce, uh, you know small and medium enterprises were almost shut down, restaurants were shut down, uh, hotels up to now I think they have just about 15 percent of uh, capacity. So when you look at the economic impact for us is huge, but the human impact we as I today we have about. Uh, uh, 65,000 uh, cases there about in Nigeria, and we have 100, uh, 1,165 deaths. So it's not really much compared to our population, which uh, is, uh, you know, a population of 200 uh, million. But because of the economic impact, a lot of people uh, couldn't really go out to make their livelihood. So what we did. Uh, we have this coalition against COVID-19, of which I actually mobilized the private sector, and we raised the sum of $112 million. And what we did was now to go all out and set up 39 isolation centers, of which the smallest one is 100 beds, and the uh, biggest uh, ones are 200 beds. And they have ventilators. We bought, uh, they have ventilators. They have all the equipments. And then, we also, uh, you know, uh, uh, said, OK, fine, you know, what do we do after these uh, isolation centers? Now, people were not able to afford money to eat. So what we did, we went out and we bought uh, food for 10 million people, which is 5% of the population. That's people at the lower bottom of the pyramid. And what we did, we took 10 million people and we said, OK, fine, these 10 million people, it means that you have minimum of about 1.7 million households, and we give them food and we distribute. Uh, so that one actually reduced the effect of the, uh, you know, lockdown. So that's what we did. Um, thank you so much, Likudangor. Dr. Farmer, can you give us, you, you know, you've worked on Ebola. You've just written a book on Ebola that will be published tomorrow. How is COVID-19 different to other pandemics? How is it different to other health crises? Well, there are lots of ways in which it's different. Um, first of all, it's a respiratory virus, um, which, of course, enhances the possibility of uh, going from an epidemic to a pandemic. I have a friend who likes to say, <clears throat> excuse me, epidemics are inevitable, pandemics are optional, meaning in order to respond, we need exactly the, the kind of uh, interventions that um, I'm proud to say both my co-panelists here have engaged in both the economic and protective ones that Aliko mentioned. That is, how can you really have isolation units if there's no food? Uh, you know, or uh, you know, th this just doesn't work. We know that from the Ebola epidemic. And then the what Newbar has worked on, uh, and and I'm in Boston right now, and I can tell you that the city is celebrating. We need these new tools uh, that can change the face, not, a, not only of this pandemic, but of others. So, you know, there's a, a, a tough few months ahead, but I think all of us are feeling some relief, no matter how ambivalent it is, because of all the losses we've faced. But Dr. Farmer, you know, what we're talking about almost day in, day out, and to a certain extent, it's very surprising, is that we put the economy against actually a health crisis. I mean, what needs to come first? If we fix health and people stay at home, is that how you fix the economy? The Asian, you know, uh, countries seem to have gotten it better than a lot of our Western countries. Well, you know, the the the, the countries that have done better, and and as uh, Aliko mentioned, um, we'd be, we'd be making a mistake to not look at some of the successes in Africa as well. But just thinking about, uh, let's say, South Korea or Singapore, or Taiwan or China. Um, they have invested massive amounts uh, in social distancing, universal mask wearing, and contact tracing. And uh, contact tracing is a messy affair. Um, it's not easy to do. 
But I think one of the things that we're seeing now in the United States is uh, you could call it a containment fatigue, um, but it's really a kind of containment nihilism where we have people saying it's just not going to make a difference given the, the, the avalanche of cases. And that's not true. We still have to invest more heavily in some of those same public health standards. And that's going to be true even if we get uh, 10 more uh, new vaccines. It's going to take a long time. I'm sure Nubar can, uh, you know, can talk about the logistic challenges. But as an implementer, I mean, right here you have people who are involved all along this, call it a supply chain. You have, you know, people who are steering uh, business practices and capitalism towards a more humane and new economy. You have people and companies like Moderna that are developing new uh, technologies, in this case, a new preventive, and then you have the implementers. And I'm really one of the, the latter group, and I can tell you that there will be substantial challenges to rapid uptake of the vaccine. And it's not just vaccine hesitancy, uh, but, but questions of refrigeration, logistics, you know, where is their cell tower uh, coverage, where is there not? So it's going to require all of us to go all in uh, just to take up these new tools. So I think we're going to have to remember our old public health lessons in the uh, month going forward as well. So, Dr. Rafia, now that we have the, the formula, or we think we have the formula that could be approved, what are your main challenges to actually distributing the vaccine? What are the main challenges to keeping it, you know, adequate temperatures? Uh, well, Francine, one of the things we were also excited to announce today is that uh, just late last week, we obtained data on the stability of the vaccine that looks to be even better than we had previously uh, indicated. Specifically, um, we have our vaccine it requires storage at minus 20 degrees centigrade. Uh, there are others that are at much lower temperatures, but we've developed technology to keep it at minus 20. But what's exciting is that We've also shown that we can actually keep the vaccine just in refrigerated two to eight degrees centigrade conditions for 30 days without losing stability. And furthermore, at room temperature for 12 hours. Uh, and so what that means is that from a supply chain standpoint, yes, we need minus 20 degrees capability at a central uh, uh, storage capability, but from there, distributing it to the point of administration and keeping it under refrigerated conditions for up to 30 days, uh, and then keeping it at room temperature is a is a is a significant improvement than where we thought we would be going into this. So that's going to help. The things we have to work out is literally just that the production ramp up is occurring. We need to, of course, put in place the type of vigilance you need, pharmacovigilance, in all the countries that we'll be operating in. Uh, Moderna is a is a young. Uh, 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 scientifically oriented company it does not have the, the kind of legacy of pharmaceutical vaccine distribution uh, of that that we will need here. So we're developing a lot of these and partnering with, with folks with the expertise to make sure we do this as safely and as uh, uh, effectively as we can. Thank you. Uh, I just want to remind everyone watching us at home or in the office or wherever you are, you can submit questions via the live Q&A feature. And I'm getting a couple of questions, which I'll get to in a second. But Aliko Dangote, what did this pandemic teach you? And then Dr. Verma, I'll come in. What did this pandemic teach you, Aliko Dangote, about you know private and public partnerships coming together? Is this, uh, uh, if we are to be also optimistic, can we work better together in the future? I think, uh, Francine, to say the truth is that uh, you know we need to work together you know i mean uh, both private sector and government they are natural partners so i believe that we need to really work together because without working together you know uh, there's no way we'll be successful so i think going forward not only uh, you know uh, uh, private sector and the governments i think even the various uh, countries they need to really come together and fight this common uh, enemy. But with the lessons that we've learned uh, in, you know, with COVID-19, I believe we will do much better in the future if there's any other pandemic that, you know, affect us. So I think, uh, you know, we will be much, much better prepared. Thank you. Dr. Farmer, you want to jump in? Well, it's, it's along those same lines, Francine. Um, you know, I would, I would uh, imagine most of your uh, viewers understand that 
this progress is incremental. And, you know, just taking the great news uh, from Moderna today, it's not as if you go to Nigeria and then suddenly uh, those uh, rolling out the vaccine have to develop an altogether new cold chain and distribution network. In fact, Nigeria, uh, and Aliko has worked on this quite a bit, has been working on polio eradication uh, for many years and quite intensively. And that's been a public-private partnership with the Ministry of Health and other ministries in the Nigerian government, working with people like Aliko, but also with the Gates Foundation, which has put you know, hundreds of millions of dollars into eradicating polio, which you know, we have some hope of seeing in, in my lifetime. When the Ebola vaccine, which is a very different kind of vaccine from the one Moderna has just announced, when that was developed, it was, uh, it was used in places uh, um, uh, using other vaccine supply chains, right? But one of the reasons that Ebola never really spread in Nigeria after it was introduced there from uh, Upper West Africa was because of the contact tracing teams that had been set up to work on polio. So I'm, I'm, just, I'm just saying, Francine, that you know, the, the, your viewers and, and all of us should understand that th one of the reasons Aliko is right when he says things are going to be better next time around is if we don't keep forgetting these lessons learned and we keep developing new technologies that are better and safer, you know, we have reason to believe that it's going to be a long time before we see another uh, massive uh, pandemic like this because we know how to act more quickly and in concert. Dr. Efrayan, is this a game changer because of the type of vaccine? So I'm not a virologist, although as a member of the media, I feel like I've had to try and become one. But, you know, talk to us about how this vaccine and the Pfizer vaccine are different to other vaccines and how they can help us in the future. Uh, happy to. So the technology that Moderna has developed is, is generally called messenger RNA-based. Uh, and... Uh, the, you may remember the, the kind of central dogma of how, how biology, how information works in cells is that DNA is copied into messenger RNA, messenger RNA is copied into proteins, and that protein is what actually does much of the functional work. Antibodies are proteins, enzymes are proteins. So, so those are the, the components that actually dictate function. And in fact, it is a protein that causes the immune system to recognize uh, a virus. And, and what messenger RNA, which had never been used before, um, uh, about 10 years ago, Moderna's pioneering efforts in this area, and it takes quite a long time to establish the foundations uh, of, of the platform needed to safely design and make these uh, uh, products. But what, what we were, we're, we're now able to do is to basically take an information molecule, messenger RNA, that codes for whatever protein we want, in this case, the spike protein that is on the surface of the virus, and just by using that information, instruct the cells in a human's body to make just that protein. So we come in with the code, our cells know how to convert that code into the business part, which is the, the protein. Once the body makes that protein, our immune system thinks that it's been infected and starts raising antibodies that attack that protein and of course, what those antibodies then do is stay on guard, looking for said protein weeks, months later. And of course, if the virus does show up, the body is prepared with very precise immune instructions to defeat it. And that's why we're able to afford a vaccine that could be 95% effective, because in those uh, subjects, in, uh, in the vaccine group, the immune system was, almost in a military sense, on guard for the very threat that they were trying to protect against. So messenger RNA is a very interesting enabler because it's an information molecule. Previously, and, uh, vaccines have been made out of either attenuated uh, viruses, so the actual uh, virus, but defective in some way so it doesn't replicate and infect you, or proteins that are made artificially uh, uh, in, through biotechnology techniques the problem with that is every single one of those proteins is a multi-billion dollar effort of a decade to design the process to make and scale up, et cetera. So that's one thing. And the second, basically, it turns out that, that that process is something your body can do. So this gives us the ability to very quickly 
make yet another one, yet another one, and your body does the rest of the work. So it's got a lot of promise. I'll say that Moderna, previous to today, had already taken into the clinic 10 different vaccines. And it is the work on those that allowed us to very quickly jump on this bandwagon. So, so this is a kind of the beginning of another armament, but there's many other innovations that will come along. Yeah. And the way, as, as Paul said, we're getting better at better, and frankly, more and more courageous at using advanced technologies and science to battle these. Historically, this industry has convinced itself that things take too long, they cost too much, and that has caused people to effectively think this is not a place where investment should go, and therefore we don't have as many effective vaccines as I suspect we will in the future. Very interesting. Um, Aliko Dangote, I have a question from the audience for you. On equitable distribution of the vaccine, do you have advice, Mr. Dangote, for Dr. Nufian and, of Mod and Moderna specifically for Nigeria, Pan-Africa? Uh, I think in, uh, for Nigeria and Africa, we will not have any problem in terms of distribution, refrigeration and distribution, because, you know, this is not really any different from the uh, vaccines that we have worked with, you know, which is the one for polio, the immunization vaccines. So distribution and the infrastructure is not really going to be a big issue for us because we have already, uh, you know, have this infrastructure. So and what we have also done, you know, we have this... Uh, uh, this thing that you call the Africa uh, uh, Center for Disease Control, they will also help in terms of the distribution. So it will help quite a lot, you know, for us to get the, uh, you know, to purchase drugs, to purchase the uh, the uh, 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 vaccines, and also to be able to distribute them equitably. You know, so I think we will not have any issues, both I mean, in Nigeria and also all the rest of uh, Africa in terms of the distribution of the vaccines. I have another question for you, um, Aliko Dangore. What role do corporate leaders need to play in the distribution of the vaccine in encouraging of mask wearing and encouraging a skeptical folks to get vaccinated? Well, I think uh, the private sector will help in terms of resources. Uh, you know, just like what we did, uh, you know, uh, in Nigeria, we have to partner with the government because most of the distribution is being done by the government. But then foundations and private sector will get involved, just like what we did between ourselves, uh, Dangote Foundation, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Gavi, and the rest in terms of the polio vaccines, you know, to be distributed. So I think uh, now we have learned quite a lot with COVID. We know exactly how to work with different uh, governments, and I'm sure it's not going to be an issue. Um, Dr. Farmer, is it up to leaders, business leaders, to do that, or will citizens really almost around the world require a new social contract with their health ministries, with their governments, and how will that change? Well, you know, just sticking to the, the, that continent, you know, I can, I, and as an American I, I, who work, has worked uh, and lived 10 years in Rwanda, uh, Rwanda, yes, there's a it's a much smaller country than Nigeria or the United States, uh, but they have done superbly in terms of building up a delivery mechanism, and their rates of vaccine uptake are much higher than uh, with many vaccines are higher than in the United States, and there's also seems to be less hesitancy uh, as well. So I think there are lessons we can learn. Uh, from from many places, places all over the world. Um, I, I share Aliko's optimism on this score. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I am, as an, like I said, as an American, I'm, I'm worried for my country as well, because, you know, you have studies showing that up to half of Americans uh, wouldn't take a, um, a COVID vaccine without uh, a lot more data and experience. And that that's, tr that's troubling. And I think that can change very swiftly. But we do have uh, a significant problem of uh, mistrust and division. And again, that's related very much to uh, economic issues. So back to your question, I think that the private sector, I mean, after all, Harvard University, Partners in Health, the Gates Foundation, the Dangote Foundation, these are all private sector, sector institutions, just like Moderna. So working together with public health authorities uh, is key, and we need business leaders, uh, people like Aliko, um, to, uh, to continue to lead um, 
and it makes a big difference. We've seen it again and again. What about regulators, Dr. Farmer? I mean, how do you change the narrative in, you know, telling people? And then the same question for uh, Dr. Afayan. How, how do you make sure that people say, right, this is a vaccine. I trust the regulators. I trust that I'm safe if I take it. And I have to listen to the science. Well, Nubar is going to know more about the the ups and downs of American regulatory systems. But I can say they're quite, uh, they're quite not, not rigid. They're, they're quite... Um, emphatic about following a set of very conservative rules, and I have faith in those uh, rules. Unfortunately, as you, as you know, Francine, there, has been, there have been attacks on the FDA and an undermining of the CDC and a questioning of, of the value of science. And, you know, the science and institutions like that are tough enough to take it. It's really the public uh, losing out that concerns me. So we have a lot of work to do on uh, building trust, but I think our regulatory agencies are really pretty solid, and if they can be kept out of the uh, the political scene or politics can be kept out of the regulatory agencies, uh, I think that we'll see improvement in the short term and more and more uptake of the vaccine, or whatever the vaccine may be. Uh, Dr. Rafian, can, can you give us, you know, your insight into how difficult is it? I mean, what's the biggest challenge now, getting people to take the vaccine or decide who to give it to first? Um, well, look, the decision on who to give it to first will, in fact, be squarely in the hand of the governments that are operating in any given jurisdiction. And in the U.S., that will be the CDC laying the, the guidelines. And, and frankly, as a private sector participant, um, I quite like that because I think we'd be in, a, in an impossible position to make such determinations. Um, and, and in terms of the regulatory process, uh, I agree with Dr. Farmer in that I think the U.S. regulators and regulators around the world have a lot of experience actually using science to make decisions, which ultimately are decision, decisions that compare the risks and the rewards of any given intervention under the circumstances we're operating in. There's a finite risk of actually contracting the disease for a certain population. It can be fatal. It can be quite debilitating for those who even survive it. And so we have to kind of balance the risk and the reward. There's no such thing, thing that as a risk-free way to deal with this type of a situation. And, and, and what the producers of these vaccines will do is to generate with the best possible approaches the data needed to be able to make these decisions. The thing we have to realize is that the more data is generated upon further administration and, and early distribution, the more there will be a body of, of fact to base this on. But I, I agree as well that it's been extremely disheartening to see kind of science and expertise twisted in so many ways over the past few months, either to kind of overstate all the ways in which this can go wrong and, and the likelihood that none of this will work, or understate the nature of the threat, the effectiveness of what we can do about it through behavioral modifications, or the possibility that antibody treatments, vaccines, and the like could, in fact, rise to the challenge. And I'll tell you, there's been a lot of dogmatic thinking that has completely confused the situation, partly because people have said all previous vaccines, for example, have taken five to 10 years to develop at a minimum. Therefore, anything that takes less than five years to develop must not be done safely. Well, that is a, that's a political statement, even by scientists. That's not a scientific statement because that takes out of contention the possibility of innovation and progress that still succumbs to the, the appropriate safeguards. So I, I look for, and of course, we're living moment by moment in this, in this world of social interconnections uh, in, through the media and, and through, 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 through internet that makes us constantly think about the topic more than ever. I think over some period of time, people are going to start resolving in their own minds who they believe, what they're willing to, to, to do, and what benefit they expect. And I think this will begin to, to resolve itself. So the only way we're going to get out of this, in my view, is that the collective immune system of humanity mounts an effective defense against a predatory virus that is abusing our social nature. Basically, but for our social nature, this virus would be long extinguished. But we're not willing to be completely a, a non-social, and therefore we need to protect ourselves. Our immune system can be trained to do that, and we're seeing the first signs that it can be effective. 
Right. And then there's a whole concern about asymptomatic people and stuff like that. But um, Dr. Afian, have you seen an unprecedented, you know, coming together of public and private uh, partnerships of actually money coming together? And is that going to continue for decades to come in dealing with the next crisis? Boy, uh, we have seen we have seen an unprecedented collaboration and I'd say an unprecedented uh, willingness to spend capital at risk. I'll tell you that Moderna uh, being a fairly recently uh, a public company uh, from the point of view of trading on the stock exchange went out early this year and obtained from our shareholders initially some half a billion dollars and eventually well over a billion dollars of at risk capital to deploy itself to be able to move much more rapidly than we could even get government support to be able to do this uh, unprecedented uh, 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 task. The government, through the U.S. Operation Warp Speed, joined, BARDA did, in supporting us very, very strongly, all at risk, without knowing whether the vaccine would work at all. And so did they support many other companies, uh, some very large pharmaceutical companies, uh, and, and we're very, very glad with that. The NIH, who has partnered with us, the, the National Institute of Infectious Disease, headed by Dr. Fauci, has been our partner for many years. And that partnership absolutely kind of saved the day in terms of enabling us to work very quickly towards getting a clinical uh, a program off the ground. There was no way within a few weeks of knowing the sequence of this new virus that we could have entered clinical trials. So anywhere you look, there's been unprecedented collaboration. There's been collaboration among the companies, the data sharing. We are using standard testing protocols, standard clinical protocols, so that people can confidently compare our results. None of this was happening before, but none of this should be the subject of a pandemic because none of us are disadvantaged at acting this way. And to your question, Francine, looking forward, I certainly expect and hope that out of this, we will at least take away the lesson that we cannot wait to become sick in order to have ways to treat our condition. I would contend to your listeners that we have a healthcare system that can be best described as a sick care system. And the problem with a sick care system is that it doesn't do much to protect those bef before they are sick uh, and, and to avoid getting sick. And that mindset has to change. We now know enough about our immune system and how to get it ready that I think there can be many, many new Vaccines in a general term, it seems like an old concept, but the modern vaccines will be able to precisely tune the immune system to any number of threats, present or future, such that we can be actually very rapidly mobilizing. If we cannot, as a society, change our social contract, uh, 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 someone mentioned about that, so that we demand from, from our governments expenditures that are not oriented towards sick care, but rather what I call health security, expenditures that can get treatments ready and if, uh, uh, tested, then I think it will have been a missed opportunity to do something good from the pandemic. Aliko, thank you. Aliko Dangote, do you feel the same? Do you think there'll be much more uh, funding, much more money from private individuals or the private sector into trying to, to find some of these challenges and fix some of these healthcare concerns? Well, I think uh, now, just like uh, what Afed said earlier on, uh, if you look at it before, nobody believed that you can actually go and get a vaccine within a period of four or five years. But with what really uh, happened today with the uh, success of Moderna, with the success of Pfizer, I think, uh, you know, people, the private sector will be able and willing to pump in so much money and, uh, you know, partner with the pharmaceutical companies. So, I mean, people are not really going to be, uh, you know, scared about investing. You know, now people know that it is possible. You don't have to wait for four or five years to, uh, you know, have a vaccine. Uh, I think it's going to be really, really good for, uh, you know, for even us in the private sector to take that risk and give a seed money for a pharmaceutical company to uh, get a vaccine. But like what you said in the other question, whether... Will, we will accept. I would like to just say something. You know, in Africa, normally, uh, once it is approved by uh, other agencies and also especially WHO, we will not have any problem in terms of using the uh, vaccine. It shouldn't be an issue at all. Aliko, how do you think we'll deal with the next pandemic? Will we deal with it better? Do we have, you know, the tools to deal with it better now? And how will it be different? 
I think it will be different because, uh, you know, other pandemic uh, we've learned quite a lot. It's just like uh, what Dr. Palmer said earlier on. You know, we learned quite a lot in dealing with, uh, you know, uh, Ebola. And if you look at it, all the equipment that we had during Ebola, we just updated them, just like the infrared cameras, like the infectious disease center, which we built uh, here in Nigeria, uh, WTA Foundation built in Ikeja. Uh, we use it at the beginning of the crisis of uh, COVID. So I think it is not really uh, going to be, uh, you, know, uh, you know, an issue. Uh, we have learned quite a lot. I think the lessons that we've learned, especially with this deadly pandemic, uh, has given us a lot of ideas of what to do in the future, in case there's any other one. Um, Dr. Farmer, how do you see the next, I mean, we don't know what the pandemic is. We hope we don't have another pandemic. But, you know, what are the lessons learned to this time that will service us for the next one? Well, w one of the lessons that is worth underlining is as has been pointed out, we don't have a health care system, we have a sick care system. But our sick care system is sick also. Um, you know, um, I'm again, I'm switched hats to, to speak as an American. We have a very fractured uh, sick care system. And when you're sick or injured, you need that sick care system. And the general the general terms that that I would use looking forward are it will be a huge mistake if we continue to fail to invest in robust health care systems. So all of the things that you've heard described by Aliko, uh, you know, in, in Nigeria, these were investments in the health care delivery system, right? Whether you're talking about a treatment center or a uh, infrared camera to detect a febrile traveler or, you know, uh, vaccine distribution points, the cold chain, these are part of a health care system. But there are a lot of places in the world where there just really aren't functioning healthcare systems. And in these clinical deserts, that's where these pathogens, and they're mostly viruses, that's where they, they spread and they can emerge from there as well. And I've worked in a lot of clinical deserts and I've seen them watered quickly. For example, when I first went to Rwanda, you know, uh, they were recovering from, you know, uh, the genocide and it was, as you might expect, a clinical uh, desert. But they put in place the staff, the stuff, the space and the systems required to deliver not just curative care or treatment for injuries, but also preventive tools like the ones that Nubar is talking about. So I really, really hope that that's one of the lessons that we take out of Ebola, out of influenza, you know, uh, pandemic influenza, and most of all, out of COVID-19, is we really have to put more of our resources into a healthcare delivery system that is able to prevent illness and injury as well as respond to it. Dr. Farmer, what do we misunderstand about healthcare systems in Africa? Well, I mean, I, I think when you go to, you know, I'm using this term clinical desert uh, as, as we would speak of a, a food desert. But in, you know, why did Ebola really take all of its toll in the 2014 epidemic that went on for some time, only in Liberia, Syria, Sierra Leone, and Guinea? It did not take its toll in Nigeria or in other neighboring countries. It was really largely limited there. And when there were secondary cases in the United States or Europe, they were stopped. What, what we need to learn about uh, care delivery systems in Africa is they're just as varied as anywhere else, right? You can have, you have countries where there are strong systems, you have districts where there are strong systems. They can be in the same uh, country as a, uh, as a district with very weak uh, healthcare delivery systems. And each place has its reasons, right? There could be a history of conflict, of drought, of all sorts of things, including the massive underinvestment in healthcare delivery of colonial rule. I mean, that just ended recently. I was, a, you know, I was around the planet in any case. So those are investments in some places that have never been made. Again, what are they? Staff, nurses, for example, doctors, technicians, managers, stuff, we have a new vaccine, that's stuff, right? Space, safe clinical spaces. This is an, uh, a pathogen like Ebola that spreads between caregivers. What does a safe space look like? And finally, systems, you know, try 
distributing a vaccine without systems, and you'll see that it doesn't work. So those are the kind of dull as dishwater investments that we need to be making in our, and, and you know, in the jargon of my field, that's just called health system strengthening. And although it is dull sounding and sometimes dull in doing, it is critically important if we're going to prevent catastrophes like this from uh, taking hold in the future. Um, Dr. Affin, are you, are you already working on on trying to prevent the next pandemic? I mean, I know you said, you know, it's what we're doing at the moment is having a healthcare system that treats the sick, and we need to, to treat people before it happens to that. But again, how do you also make sure that, uh, uh, you know, the next pandemic is stopped on its tracks? Well, uh, and I would say that, that by coining it as a pandemic, you know, we kind of think about it as something that happens once in 100 years. And so therefore, you know, one might think, you know, how do you know which where it's going to come from, what it is, etc. But the reality is that, you know, all new pathogen infections have a possibility of that. And if you treat it as though they don't, then some subset of them will become epidemics and then pandemics. And so I think what, what we are doing, just so I can kind of maybe think about the, the cutting edge technology that's being developed, we now have enough understanding about the sequence of these various viruses that we can actually, ahead of time, look at every single genetic change that that virus could undergo and figure out the subset that would allow the virus to live, for example. That will define the living space that that virus can occupy. We can also determine of those possible virus variants, for example, from the SARS-CoV virus, of which this is a, a variant that we saw, what are the, the common vulnerabilities, the spike protein that they share, against which we could make one common vaccine that could treat many of them, if not all of them. For example, those Achilles heel sequences are being identified, and we are actually quite actively working on that. Then, of course, with the messenger RNA technology, we have the ability to very rapidly take any sequence and convert it into a vaccine we can test in animals. So that capability applied to not one virus, but 20, 50, 100, that, all of that can now be done through what humans have developed and the technology that actually is going to benefit from this experience. So I think that, you know, we, we're less going to spend time trying to speculate what the next pandemic might be than to guard ourselves. And this is why we call this health security. We think that we need a global pathogen shield, not unlike missile shields that have been developed in the military or nuclear shields that have been developed. We will come under attack and the concept of a shield has to invoke our immune system and then the, 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 the information that we could glean about the nature of the attacker. All of that is being done. And of course, doing that requires long-term thinking, long-term investment, and regulators and governments who are willing to invest in the preparedness that somehow the world has de-emphasized over the past years, certainly decade, and, and we just cannot let that happen. The problem with pandemics is they, they come rarely, and therefore people assume, well, I've got insurance against that. I don't have to do anything else. But that's the wrong mindset. We just lost you know, millions of people. We will have lost certainly over a million people, and, and, and who knows where this ends. And I think the technologies exist. The regulators have to be more thoughtful about it, and governments have to think of this as part of their security guarantee to their populations. That is to protect their health against these kinds of threats. There's a lot we can do, and I expect we will do. Aliko Dangota, what, what are some of the conversations that you're having with your government in Nigeria, other governments in Africa, to you know maybe put in place some of the things that Dr. Afian was just talking about? Well, I think uh, what we're doing right now, first of all, with the case of this uh, pandemic, you know, we've actually realized and we noticed that. Uh, we have, you know, we have underinvested in our healthcare, just like what Dr. Farmer said in Africa, we need to invest more money in uh, our, you know, health infrastructure. But going uh, forward, you know, for us in Nigeria and also, uh, you know, Africa, we have what you call the Africa Center for Disease Control, and this, uh, you know, this is one of the this and that will coordinate all the activities to make sure that smaller countries where they don't have, uh, you know, first of all, they have to raise money. Secondly, is to buy vaccines and uh, also drugs for this pandemic. And smaller countries that don't have the means 
of getting people to help them, they will send people down there to see how they can assist them. So I think going forward, uh, you know, we shouldn't really have much, uh, you know, uh, issues. It's just that we have to keep investing heavily in, uh, you know, our health sector. Should we talk, uh, Liquid Angota, more about funding? Is this one of the main barriers to actually dealing with, you know, a health crisis effectively? I think, yes, I agree with you. It's more to do with funding. I mean, like what we are doing in Nigeria as uh, a foundation, we are trying to uh, sponsor a bill to our Congress where we want uh, them to impose a tax. Uh, this is a separate tax, not the corporate tax. It's a separate tax of maybe about 1% of all our profits, all our profits in the private sector, so that they will fund educate. I mean, uh, they will fund uh, health, and I think it is the only way. You know, we cannot just leave government alone. Government alone cannot fund health. So we, the foundations, the private sector, and then the government, we have to actually work together to make sure that uh, we fund uh, health. You know, it is a very, very important sector. And, you know, without healthy population, there is no way you'll have a healthy economy. Um, Dr. Farmer, uh, so I have a question, actually, for all three of you, um, saying that uh, this person's writing in, so thank you so much, all of you who are writing uh, these questions. I believe all three of the panelists have worked with Bill Gates in one way or another. Just how critical are his contributions to the broader effort to battle the pandemic. I don't know whether you you want to talk about the Bill Gates Foundation, Dr. Farmer, or just the, the need of some well, of these, you know, names that everyone convalesces around. Well, um, yeah, I'll just put it in stark terms. Um, you know, I, I started medical school in 1984, and th this field that we now call global health uh, was really you know, dead in the water. It was uninspired, it lacked ambition, and it was, it was called international health at the time, um, or even overseas health, you know, where you need to ask the question, well, which C are we talking about? So it wasn't just Bill Gates, Bill and Melinda Gates, and, and actually Bill Gates' father uh, was involved as well. In starting this uh, foundation, um, really kind of did CPR on global health um, because not only was it starved for resources, as long as it involved poor people, it was starved for resources, regardless of where they lived. And, uh, and so this, this generated a, um, a new wave of interest uh, and also led to a lot of development of new techniques. So I, and and you know, if you think about polio eradication, um, we haven't eradicated any pathogen except for smallpox, really, a uh, human pathogen, maybe rinderpest in cattle, maybe guinea worm is coming, but polio, to, to wipe that out, that, when that happens, we should look to Melinda and Bill Gates and say thank you. And if I could extend this metaphor, though, a little bit, uh, Newbar's metaphor about, uh, or the immune system uh, as more than metaphor, um, you know, we need to think about how to protect ourselves by extending our metaphoric immune system as well. I mean, when we talk about essential workers and then don't make sure they have unemployment uh, insurance or protection, when we see families, I mean, you know, I've, I, all of us know people who've lost their jobs and all of us know people who don't have, in this country, in the United States, who don't have uh, adequate health insurance and they don't have an employment insurance. So I think this, this idea of us being at risk and doing things to protect ourselves, a shield, as it were, that needs to involve a new way of thinking about the economy as well. Uh, and, and I believe that um, this is one of the areas where Bill and Melinda Gates have, they've learned a lot uh, in, on the way as well. They've taught us a lot, they've invested a lot, uh, but they're seeing more and more, again, when Ebola came along, and they were talking about polio eradication. In Nigeria, it was turning that system towards Ebola that slowed it down. That is, investing in healthcare systems for a reason, but make them nimble enough so that they can turn on a dime and make sure we protect the essential workers, not just the doctors like me, but all of those who are required to help us respond to health crises like this. Dr. Rafayan, I know, I mean, this has been a pretty terrible pandemic because of the lives lost, because of the number of people infected. If anything good or hopeful can come out of the pandemic on how we can do better, what would it be? 
Um, I would say um, more courage, more investment, more collaboration, and not accepting the status quo. Um, let me let me come back and address something you just Paul just mentioned uh, about the, the the immune system. I actually agree completely that if you think about all of humanity as one entity, then the medical profession, the healthcare system, is our immune system. And metaphorically, in terms of if we were one body, that would be the organ. It's actually an organ. And when that organ is failing, when that organ is damaged, then we're not going to be able to mount a proper immune system across the population, not within our own bodies. It's no different. And any more than we would want a failing liver or a failing kidney, we need an active immune system. And I think that is the way to think about it. That's, that's the first thing. And the second thing to your question about what could come out of it, I mean, look, we're talking today about uh, uh, pathogens and, and disease threats of the sort that COVID-19 is. But let me just point out that a pandemic, more broadly speaking, is anything that affects all the people. And we have many, many pandemics, diseases that affect the whole global population, against which we should mount the same optimistic uh, crusade to try to defeat it, in my view. And, and that's something that, that I believe should come out of this. People should feel more confident about what we can do if we work together and put the resources in. And I'll mention one thing, we're talking about spending more. I actually think we need to look for the day where we spend less on health. And among the way we're gonna spend less on health is that if we spend less on sick care and spend more on securing our health, the two go hand in hand. Think about the analogy to the military. Yes, you want to have expensive weapons, but you want to use them sparingly because you want to put a lot of money upstream never to have to use them. I don't see how it's any different. I don't see how. So, so I think there's a lot of things that will be changing our mindsets, and we look forward to it. Um, Eliko Dengode, maybe the final word from you on what we have learned. If anything good can come out, good or hopeful can come out of COVID-19, what would it be? Uh, well, so something good will come out of it, you know. I believe now what we'll do uh, is that, you know, with the vaccines that, uh, you know, they are going to, you know, uh, release very soon, we need to now see, okay, fine, how do we get back to, uh, how do we, I mean, how do we go back to free COVID in terms of the economy? And also, how do we stimulate uh, consumption? How do we stimulate investment? And uh, how do we get back to uh, free COVID? And I think uh, what we need to do in Africa is mainly to make sure that uh, we, uh, you know, we get people back to work. Areas where they have suffered, you know, uh, they are still suffering. We need to get them back on track so that the uh, economic activities will turn back to uh, normal. And I'm sure we'll do that. We've learned a lot, and I'm sure, you know, we'll get onto that. Fabulous. Thank you so much to our wonderful panelists, Dr. Nubar Afayan and Dr. Paul Farmer, for your valued insight. We, of course, extend our gratitude to you, Aliko, and the Dangote Group for hosting this session. And thanks to everyone listening. And have a great day, everyone.